Hey friends, Catherine here, and welcome to another conversation for Research Rockstars. I'm very happy today to introduce a special guest. Uh, today I have with me Stephen Griffiths. Um, Stephen has been working in the market research space for over nine years, including at Nielsen, Procter & Gamble, and he is currently the Consumer Insights Lead for Cheerios Innovation at General Mills. I just have to say, Stephen, I think you have the coolest job title in the world. I think being being respo responsible for Cheerios innovation just sounds so cool. It is super fun. Yeah, my uh, kids think it's awesome too. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, and you, of course, you're also the host of um, a very popular podcast for those of us in market research, Digging for Insights. Uh, and I know you've interviewed some amazing folks there, including folks who are the heads of insights at uh, General Mills, Electrolux, and Nestle. Um, and I've listened to a couple of your podcasts, and they are really, really excellent. So I definitely recommend people check that out. And um, Stephen knows I'm very passionate about learning and training, obviously here at Research Rockstar. And uh, Stephen also describes himself as a lifelong learner, an attribute that I truly appreciate. Um, he also has an MBA in marketing research and has taken uh, courses in market research topics from Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, and Data Camp. So thanks for joining me here today, Stephen. Oh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me allowed to be part of your podcast. So you and I recently had a conversation about all of the various types of e-learning that's available to those of us who are in the market research and insight space. Um, and we talked about, you know, the fact there's so many different sources for learning, you know, free sources, paid sources. Um, you know, you mentioned, for example, that you've taken some courses at places like Coursera and LinkedIn Learning, you know, and also in that conversation, you um, and I'll post a link to it here so our folks can, can find it over on your podcast. Um, you know, we talked about the fact that there's just a lot of different skills that people might need to acquire or refresh. Um, and we talked about a lot of different sources for those um, types of things, free sources, paid sources, short sources, longer sources. Um, and so I wanted to invite you here today to go into a little bit more about what some of the choices are that people have, because there are so many different places where people can go online these days to learn. You know, you can just go into your favorite search engine and type in survey training, or you go to your favorite search engine and say, you know, where can I learn about market segmentation? And, and you'll get you'll get choices, you know. Um, I wish they all went straight to Research Rockstar, but that's not reality, <laughs> right? So there are a lot of choices that are out there. Um, so what I wanted to do today is I wanted to share with folks what I think some of the important criteria are, especially, you know, as people are planning their, you know, for their own e-learning or for their team's uh, training plans. I want to talk about what some of the choices are that are out there for, um, you know, either acquiring or refreshing market research related skills. And, um, and then, you know, Stephen, as we go through this, I was hoping that I could, you know, turn to you to get your opinion on how you might make some of these choices, either for yourself or for people that you work with. Sure. Happy to do that. Um, so, of course, one of the big things with these different programs is the amount of time. You know, there's definitely some training that is very significant. Um, for example, if you sign up for a class at a university, you know, you're making a semester long commitment. And then at the other extreme, there's, you know, these little mini online self-paced courses where you might have uh, some, re you know, things that you read and you take a quiz or you watch a uh, a couple of recordings and you take a quiz and the course is done, right? And right. then there are, of course, things that are kind of in between um, uh, there as well. One of the things I always think of is that to some extent when people are looking at their training options that they have to kind of make that choice between, you know, time and depth, right? You know, there are some topics where, you know what, two hours is sufficient. You know, for my purposes, if I could just get a couple of hours on, I don't know, hypothetically, maybe I just want, you know, gosh, I wish in two hours somebody could just tell me, you know, at a high level, what are the basics I need to know about pricing research? Or in just two hours, can somebody just give me like the basics of what I need to know about product concept testing? Um, but there are other times where you're like, you know, for this topic, I really do want to go deep. Um, and that's going to be important to me. So in your experience, Stephen, have you ever had to struggle at all? Or do you have certain types of topics where you're more inclined to go for the quick hit versus going deep? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you brought up a really good point, Catherine. Um, 
I think even more than before, there's more of an appetite to get something really quick, really easy. And then maybe earlier, there was more thought of, oh, I'm going to really invest in this. And I think because of that, there's a lot more competition out there for um, educational options available. You know, I think one of the ways when you want a quick hit, so LinkedIn Learning, I think, has done a really good job of that. They cater to business professionals who, frankly, don't have any time. And so if you take a course on data science or R or survey writing, um, they'll keep it really short. So most of the courses, I think, are like an hour or two. And if you're like me and you change the speed to like one and a half or two times the regular speed, then you know that you can get through a lot of information. Um, but to your point, I think that's more of just a high level understanding of what's in play. And then you'd have to learn more after that. Um, so I guess to answer your question, to me, it really comes down to uh, what's the purpose of your learning? Is it to just get an awareness of the topic? Maybe you're not doing the work, you're hiring it out to, to someone else, in which case you just need a, a surface level understanding. So one or two hour training is fine. Are you trying to actually learn a, a hard skill that you're actually going to be using? Then that is probably worth investing um, in a much longer um, and larger time investment um, opportunity. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, but just like taking questionnaire design or, sur you know, survey design, questionnaire design as you prefer, um, as an example. So clearly there are some one hour, two hour classes on it. And then of course, like here at Research Rockstar and, and our competitors like Burke, you know, they also have our, our, our courses, like one of our survey research courses is six hours. Um, I think Burke is somewhere around, around that, if not longer. Um, and so, you know, even somebody who's looking to, you know, if you're trying to take a topic like survey research in one hour, you know, and obviously this is me being somewhat biased, but like really how, you know, I appreciate your point that in an hour I can learn some of the lingo. Maybe I'm not going to be a hands-on questionnaire designer. I'm not going to be the one who's actually writing the questions and choosing the scales, but I still, I don't know, there's part of me that cringes at the idea of a one hour survey design class, you know, just because it's like, well, then, you know, like, what would they know? Like, would they know, you know, would they know the difference between, um, you know, uh, a Likert scale and a semantic differential scale? Would they have heard of, you know, constant sum questions? Would they, like, what, you know, how much would they, would, could they really, could they really get? But I guess that's, you know, the buyer beware thing, right? So. Yeah, I agree with you. There are definitely times that there are some topics that, you know, I would probably say to some people, yeah, you should take the one hour version of that. But boy, for some market research topics, I just, oh, it almost makes me feel like it would be dangerous for somebody <laughs> to take a one hour class on survey design. I mean, and that, <laughs> welcome to learning today, right? I think it's very easy to run around with scissors because you're right. Like there's a lot of things that are purposely trying to be cheap and fast and easy and they don't paint the whole picture. And so I think that's why it's really important as a research community that we have conversations about that, right? Um, you know, what are things you really need to know? So I, quick story for you. So um, I had a friend who um, worked on a project um, as an um, internship, and uh, this friend did some uh, linear regression, and you know, it was like um, low stakes kind of thing, but just trying to experiment with some information, and it came back and was like, oh, I, I wish that had gone better, or I didn't get very significant results from this regression. And then later we took a more detailed um, analytics course as part of our MBA. And uh, this person was like, oh, wow, like I wish I'd known the details of all this because that would have changed the way around the regression earlier. And so I think you're exactly right that there's some topics like re linear regression, you better know the assumptions of linear regression, right? Or that's not going to go very well for you versus other topics that, you know, if you're writing a five minute survey about customer satisfaction, you know, maybe you don't need to know about all the nuances of the Likert scale, right? So I think okay. it sort of depends what, what your end goal is. Yep, excellent. No, I love your example of uh, linear regression. Um, and actually, I'll use that uh, as another twist on that is, you know, that idea that there are certain types of things that you need to know as a project manager, but not to the level of doing it yourself. It's like, I need to know enough about the subject so I know what it is and when to use it, maybe what some of the pros and cons are, but I don't need to do it myself. So for example, in, um, in the world of survey research, a couple of the very popular statistical techniques that we use are factor and cluster analysis. These are just you know, forms of data, you know, data reduction techniques, multivariate data techniques, extremely tried and true, often used in uh, market segmentation studies, uh, but also in product concept testing studies too sometimes. Um, so really well-known well methods. 
So we at Research Rockstar, and I'm sure other folks do this too, we, we kind of teach it in two different ways. We have a class that's really more geared towards the project manager that's sort of like introduction to factor and cluster analysis. And when might these be relevant and why you as a project manager need to know because if you're doing a project that's gonna use that statistical technique down the road, that you know your data analyst team is gonna be doing that analysis, you have to plan for it when you're doing your questionnaire design. You know, you got to know enough upfront to make it possible for the data analyst to do that work later. So there's, you know, in that class, you know, they, you know, you want them to know what it is. You want them to know what their considerations are for the questionnaire design. Um, you want them to know what they need to tell the data analyst. Uh, you might even give them some tips for how to manage, um, you know, clients who might be trying to push too much into your instrument while you're trying to save your some variables for this. Right. That's you know? never happened before, never. Happened. <laughs> and so, um, and but then we have, the, but then we teach how to do it in SPSS and that's a totally different class. And, you know, I always tell people like, you know, I always run into researchers who feel like maybe stats isn't their strong suit, but I always try to encourage them. You can know enough about stats to, leverage the power of, of that kind of data analysis without having to actually be the hands-on stats person. Um, and so I try to get people a little bit more comfortable um, with it. Um, and, uh, and I just think it helps so much when you understand a little bit more about, when you understand enough about stats so that you really know what types of techniques you're gonna wanna use for a particular project. Yeah, I, I think that's well articulated. The amount of information you need to run a project is very separate than to actually do the project. And um, I think the caveat there to your point is for a long-term career, the more you know, the better off you'll be. But I think I've also had situations where you learn something very technical. And if you're not using that program regularly, you're not going to remember it. So there's this, you know, you got to find the right level of learning given where you're at in your career. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. It's it's just so so true. It's like um, I've done a lot of projects over the years that used you know you know you know discrete choice and max diff and other types of techniques. If you don't do that stuff all the time, you do get rusty. It's really best to you know either you know if you're really going to get hands on, you you really got to try to keep it uh, keep it at the application level on your in your day-to-day -day work otherwise it does tend to evaporate unfortunately yeah. um luckily we get to save our sps syntax files and that helps um <laughs> but um another thing i wanted to talk about in terms of the you know the trade-off so we talked a little bit about you know you have to kind of trade off like how much time you want to spend versus how much depth you want um, but i think it's also really important to recognize that also people have different learning styles and for some people you're going to want a more interactive personalized experience and for other people you want the total self-paced and so you probably have seen some e-learning referred to as synchronous versus asynchronous right so synchronous being i'm real time it's online but i'm real time with the instructor and other students and asynchronous it's totally self-paced uh, nobody's real time together you you go at your own pace um, one of the things though I do think that is important is that even within those formats, there's there's some differences. So, you know, if you're working on topics, if you're looking to develop certain types of skills, yeah, you want maybe more interactivity with an instructor. Other types of topics, totally great to, to sort of be self-paced, you know? Um, and, you know, I know, that there are certain topics that I would generally recommend people take self-paced. Like if you're doing just like basic market research 101, hey, if you want to take with the instructor, that's great. We have that option at Research Rockstar. But for myself and everybody else who teaches market research 101 types type courses, a lot of that stuff is definitions. You know, it's like, here's your reading, here's the lecture. It, yeah, there's some conversation, but just getting the basic knowledge of the concepts and the best practices, some of that's just really you know, learning facts. Right. And you could do that anytime, right? Not have to necessarily have a live instructor for some of that portion. Yeah. And some people want to go through that stuff really quick. And that's, and that's great. If that's how you learn, I think that for certain topics, that's, that really works. But I also find that there are some people who um, 
they really need the interactivity of being with an instructor. Because even though, sure, they can do the reading and they could watch a recorded video, they almost need like a, the, the accountability of interacting with an instructor. Yeah, t totally agree. I mean, people's lives are busy. I think one of the challenges with, you know, so I'm a corporate researcher, but I'm sure the same thing applies, you know, when I was in supplier side, same thing. Lives are busy, right? And frankly, there are times where you have to try to defend the time you have for learning. And how do you do that effectively? You know, and if it's like, well, you know, I'm supposed to go to this other meeting and it's sort of optional, but maybe I should go. It's easier to justify that time if you have scheduled time with a live instructor who's going to be there versus, oh, well, I could watch it some other time. And then it's really easy to kick the can on, <laughs> on when you're going to watch that video, right? Um, so I definitely think there's a lot of, especially for time crunch situations, you need to get something done. Having an in-person, I think, can make a lot of sense for a lot of people. Yeah. And I think there's some really interesting evidence about it too. Um, you know, I remember when the whole when MOOCs first became popular, right? Mm -hmm. So these massive online classes and, uh, you know, you'd see these news stories where, you know, some of the big universities are reading 10,000 people signed up for the data analysis, data analytics class, whatever. But guess what percent of people completed? Mm, less I have than no one, idea. Less than 1%. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Boy, that's crazy. I mean, honestly, it doesn't surprise me though. So I remember in my undergraduate, you know, working with a lot of, you know, smart people who got into college. And yeah, I think same thing with online classes that you would take at the university at the time that was 100% online. Yeah, I want to say it was like uh, 20, 30% completion rates. And these are people enrolled at the college who know how to just do college. It's just shocking. And I really think that behavior, and, and maybe we're learning it better with COVID, right? Yeah, <laughs> but in yeah. general, it's a lot of self-control in order to carve out time like that. And there's a lot of benefit just having to show up at a specific place in a specific time. Yeah. And those free MOOCs, I mean, it was just like, I've got no skin in the game. I didn't pay for it. I have no relationship. You know, I'm one of 10,000 people. <laughs> I have no relationship. So, you know, what's my real incentive to complete? So, you know, and, and even at Research Rockstar, we struggle with this where, um, you know, it's some students are like, they're all about completing. They want to they want to go through the course and pass the final exam, which is, of course, all online so that they get their certificate of completion. And then they can use those hours towards other certificates and insights association credentials, et cetera. And then, you know, we've got some people who are like they get to like 50, 60 percent and they're like, OK, I got what I needed from this class. Interesting. Uh, well, and to me, maybe that goes to where, what their goal was, right? If their goal was like, you know, actually no one's going to care about the certificates, uh, you know, for some people, given their stage of career, they, they might not. And it might just be like, I just need to understand enough about segmentation or survey writing or report writing. And this gives me the skills I need to do my job. And if that's their goal, then maybe completion is, is less of a priority, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't have to complete. I mean, I we, we don't require it. It's just, it's really only necessary if, you know, again, if you want to use it for some sort of certificate program or um, in some companies, they, um, the management requires proof of completion mm, when the company is, when the company is paying, but not always, not always. So yeah, so it's, it's kind of interesting. Like I always try to encourage people to complete because I want them to have that sense of completion. Mm. Also, we like it, the instructors and myself, we like it when people take the final exam because that tells us how well we did. If oh. everybody's passing the final exam, that means we met the learning objectives, everything's good. But if we've got, you know, oh gosh, you know, everybody's tripping up at this question or at that question, we need to go back to that part of the class and fine tune it because people are not getting that key point. Yeah, that's a great point. So my my dad is a uh, a professor right now, and so he has the same thing, right? He re retired, started teaching university, and that's exactly right. Like the essays, the final, the check ins, like that's how you check understanding and, and get feedback. And as a teacher, you know, and I've taught classes before too, like you really want that feedback. So that totally makes sense. Yeah, and it's it's really hard sometimes when on some of these topics too, because some of these topics are pretty complex, and so you know I can be conversing with somebody you know, or have an email exchange or they do a homework assignment and it's pretty decent, but they could still not have gotten enough or retained it enough. Yeah. So, you know, um, and, and frankly, you know, and I, I know a lot of people don't like to take tests, but there's actually a lot of research on this. There's a lot of research that shows that 
taking quizzes and tests actually helps with your own comprehension and retention. I could imagine that. I mean, I think there's some study and seriousness that goes on when you know you're going to take a test or a quiz. And so you're probably going to focus on remembering it more than if it's just some free class that you have no accountability for. Yeah. And we know that repetition works, you know, repetition does lead to retention and the repetition you get from taking a, an, an exam um, can really just be yet another opportunity to uh, try to solidify that new knowledge. Um, so I guess the one other thing that I would say that I think is a, um, a variation um, in terms of the types of learning programs that are out there is whether or not all the homework is automated or is all the are all the homeworks and, and assignments automated or is there actual human review mm -hmm. um and i have to be honest Stephen. i mean this is something i've always struggled with at research rockstar because i want the students to have human review of their work especially for topics like report writing survey writing yeah i can ask you questions about those things and what the best practices are and you know definitions and all that kind of stuff but I want to also see that you can actually do it, but I'll tell you, you know, I find that as time goes on that we have more and more students who want everything to be fully automated and I, believe me, I look into it. I know what the state of <laughs> options are out there. There's no way for us to automate homework reviews of say writing an executive summary. Yeah. No, and, and I think that's part of what you're offering, right? At Research Rockstar and other places is if you want the highest level of training, you're probably going to need that not to be automated, right? So it's it's very interesting how other companies are tackling this. So I remember taking a, a data um, science with R course uh, from Coursera, and I thought, how in the world, are, you know, there's like one professor for like 10,000 students, exactly like you're talking about, right? And you know, how are they going to do this? And it's very interesting. They do a lot of peer review work. So you actually have to review very specific criteria, and then you review three other peers, and you actually learn quite a lot in the process of what they're doing right and wrong that maybe you didn't consider. And so I learned a lot from it. I'd say, though, that the end of that, you get to like 80% right, because you're not having quite the nuances that you might get from someone who really knows what they're doing, but you get pretty close by looking at other examples and looking at your own work. And so I think that's what a lot of these courses you're going for, but totally with you that if you want to be like top notch or, you know, top of your class, you really need someone who has that knowledge to give that specific human feedback. And are there places within a course, you know, reading checks and other stuff that can be automated? Definitely. But in terms of the most value added, you know, executive summary kind of stuff, I don't know that that would ever go away from a human review. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that example. I, I was unaware that they did that. That's very interesting. Um, so thank you for sharing that. So I guess then, you know, just to wrap it all up, I think that, you know, in our recent conversation on your podcast that we had the discussion of what all the different training options are in e-learning for market research. And in this conversation, we talked about what some of the decisions are that people have to make. So I guess in summary, I would just say for those of us who are planning for a team or those of you who are playing for your own, um, you know, market research learning um, over the next year, you know, the decisions are when you talk about e-learning is you do have both synchronous and asynchronous. You do have instructor-led and non-instructor-led. Even in, in some cases, you may have a course that is taught asynchronous, but you get individual feedback from an instructor. But most asynchronous courses don't do that. Most asynchronous training is going to be totally automated, which again, for some of your topics, that might you know that might be fine um so you know those trade-offs between time and depth asynchronous synchronous whether or not you want that instructor feedback if you think about those types of criteria then as you go through the many options that are out there i think you'll pretty much you know figure out what's going to be the right choice I, if you still feel like there's just too many choices out there i really think that your decision criteria and i know it's easy for me to say but i do think your ultimate decision criteria should be how do you learn best are you somebody who really is very happy to be self-studying? You know, is that something that works for you? You want to read and do online tests? That that may work for you, and that might be your best bet. For other people, you know, be honest with yourself. If learning with an instructor is really what's going to help you to um, truly acquire the knowledge and understand it and be confident enough to apply it in your job, then that's going to be the difference. So, you know. If, if all if all criteria, other criteria fail, 
really just think about how you learn best. And I think that will help most people narrow down their choices pretty quickly. Um, and I think that's I think that's pretty much it. Stephen, did I miss anything on anything else like that you would use as a criteria? Yeah, I mean, I think you've hit the big buckets. Um, the other part I would just argue is um, how good you need to be at it, you know? And so do you need, are you not writing surveys yourself? You just need to be open okay at it, you know, maybe automated something makes sense. If like your job is going to hinge on writing to senior management with this new job, then maybe you're looking for a higher quality level of training. And so I think that's the other, and not just how you learn, but how high of a, a quality you're looking for to get. Yeah, I, I'm really glad you mentioned that. And to be honest, there are some great books out there, right? So if it is something where you're just looking for some, I just need to know what some of the key concepts are. I mean, I've, I've actually toyed this for, for a long time of doing a couple of episodes just on some of my favorite research books, because there are so many really good ones out there. There are also some tragically bad ones. Out there, I completely agree, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a lot of really good ones out there. And, you know, I'm a reader personally, like I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I can sit down and read for two or three hours straight and be a very happy person. Um, but, you know, that definitely there, you know, there are some awesome books out there. So maybe maybe we'll have to do that in another on another well, episode. If you do do that, I would be very interested to learn because I, once you mentioned, you know, like having recommended books that people have actually tried and read, it's a big investment to get through a book. And so knowing it's going to be worth it, I think can be important. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining me here today. And folks, I'll put down some links so that you can get over to Stephen's podcast um, and our previous conversation that he and I had recently on e-learning for market research and insights professionals. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Catherine.